Welcome to our ACCE Learning Network Hangout. This is uh, Series 4, Episode 35 for 2014. We're getting closer to the end of the year. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Roland. Good morning. Good morning. This is very new for us. Um, it's a chance for us to meet with our PLN over breakfast, uh, share practice ideas, have a good old chin wag with friends across the world. And if you're watching us live, you can post a question by going to todaysmeet.com forward slash A-C-C-E-L-N or on Twitter you can use the hashtag A-C-C-E-L-N. And I'm Roland Guesthausen, high school teacher, e-learning leader in Victoria, Australia. Um, I finished my year 12 and year 11 reports, working on my year 10 reports and this cascading series of reports are starting to uh, wear away at my patients every weekend. Um, oh, and also... It was the Doctor Who 50th anniversary special, but no spoilers uh, for those who are still waiting to watch it, as you should, um, tonight at uh, 8.30 at ABC. It's my special treat for this evening, definitely. And I'm Amanda Rablin, e-learning coordinator in uh, Brisbane and proud QSite member. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion and hopefully that will inspire a bit more Lego focus play with my daughter this afternoon. That's wonderful. Now let's get to know the... Uh, couple of people who are braving the early morning start with us as opposed to the late night start um, this morning. So Jenny, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Jenny Ashby. I'm a primary school teacher, um, ICT specialist and also reading recovery teacher. Um, Sunday morning is a very different time. I've just been out to walk the dog and um, haven't had breakfast yet, so it's still to come. Well, if you need to grab a snack to keep you sustained, let us know. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and David? Yes, I'm David Liu, secondary school teacher, and so, as my school puts it, science enthusiast, or really just as a name for it, nerd. And <laughs> yes, sort of halfway or quarter way or whatever fraction of the breakfast, going through that a little bit. Everybody's settling down on their couches as we chart the landscape of um, teachers who are working on Sunday mornings. Um, I also big hello to some of our US guests. Um, they'll be looking in. Um, it'll be five o'clock on this Saturday, and they've probably finished cutting the grass. Good morning. Now, Amanda, what do you think this hangout will be about? Um, well, today we're focusing on um, a couple of areas to do with uh, science and technology, engineering and mathematics or STEM. And I've just realized I stole your script. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> That's what we can do that. Early mornings. Um, it's yes. morning. So a few different groups exploring that. And welcome to uh, Jason as well. Just joined us. Hopefully. <laughs> so Roland, did you want to expand a little bit more on our um, topic for this morning? Yeah, I did. Um, we Years ago, I was a uh, project officer for a group called Magnet. Um, the Magnet project was started in the late 1990s. Um, Victoria was setting up some science and technology centres uh, to um, get better traction on uh, science education. The centres were scattered around uh, various schools in Victoria, um, but there was some interest in the Minister in setting up a virtual science and technology mm -hmm. centre. And uh, John Widmer, Ian Reid, um, managed to put together a successful proposal. The idea was that um, we would be decentralised and we'd be able to push out with some outreach officers um, into the various schools and help them engage with the technology. Um, at that particular key moment, um, a lot of it was computer-based. Um, we were looking at um, helping get schools connected with the internet, um, through modem or other link. Um, to um, start to publish and share some of the ideas that they were doing. Um, John's key push was to use the internet as an enabling factor, a way of uh, getting people to tell their stories. Um, when I was um, doing some work, he was most disappointed it took me two, three days to actually publish some of the photos and things I was doing. And his goal was that you do great science and technology and you publish it that night so it can be read, read and still has currency. Another, another thing that John really encouraged, and there was a wonderful chap called uh, Yuan de Ismail, and, and, and he was able to do some wonderful stuff with getting people to 
engage with it by asking questions, um, by making the technology actually bend to the needs of the user. So um, we built a interactive greenhouse. Remember, this is an early, sorry, sort of early internet days when people were just surfing web pages and um, we were still using things like Archie for looking up resources in Gopher. He wondered, and I and John and the others had built this greenhouse. It was um, had a fan, it had a light, and a heat source. And users on the internet could actually change the conditions in that greenhouse by clicking on some buttons and typing in some options onto a web page. Pretty special stuff. It meant that um, we were tinkering with an internet which you could read and write to and interact with and change. And we were excited about it. Sadly, like I guess all projects, um, the funding shifted and uh, we all kind of drifted onto uh, different projects. Until recently, um, with the interest in STEM, and John's relaunched the Magnet project. And David, that's where you pick up the threads. Uh, yeah. Um, well, basically, doing my normal thing at school, and then I got a small. Oh, that's out. No. Uh, so basically, I invite uh, into this la lovely little small organisation, uh, STEM Nets. Um, which we are now, of course, officially, uh, what is it, became an associate, association, the, um, which is you know, one of the very few that does happen. Um, what else is there? Um, so it's just, it's, we just want, uh, so why is it, um, why are we having STEM, uh, STEM ne um, this magnet, which we decided, and I think, I believe that magnet is short for something, I believe. Is it mass engineering, um, science? There. Um, yeah, just it's a need for it's a, just the nature of teaching itself requires collegiality, um, sharing resources with each other. And well, now that we're in the what twenty first century, uh, you know, we I believe this gives us even more uh, power to share with each other, so that we can uh, you know, provide the best for our students. So it's about um, <clears throat> forming these groups for teachers to collaborate with each other online, share resources, that kind of thing. So similar to what Roland was talking about um, with the STEM group that started up a while back, or the science group that started up a while, while back, and then um, kind of reinvigorating that kind of thing. I wonder if there's um, some new opportunities given the shifts in technology now to establish those collections and new things that you can try from a STEM perspective as well. What's on the horizon with you for where that group is heading? I think uh, for me personally, um, given the, well, the, uh, with the, I think in those days, internet was very, well, was still pretty early on. Um, I mean, even computing power was pretty early on with the range of devices um, such as your smartphones and pads. And uh, I guess everybody in uh, most schools, of course, and students have laptops. Um, hopefully, from my perspective, an increase in the use of those tools um, in our learning and teaching. So um, for my personal focus is using simulations and some uh, no, they're, some, they're not really high-powered simulation in terms of being huge computing power, but just uh, given that everybody now has them, um, or hopefully most of our students have them, uh, it just, I guess, brings a whole new dimension in our teaching. It's more inter be more interactive rather than um, simply observational with your animations or videos. Um, the lab that you do exploring, which and actually lets you test your hypotheses when you you know, try and do a little simulation and see what their actual response is. Um, and I guess in a way it's used to help augment experiments. Experiments are still cool and still fun, but uh, there's no reason why to limit to ourselves to just, you know, uh, experiments only. David, that's really nice to hear because what you've done isn't so much run the experiment for its own sake. You're trying to build in, perhaps subvertly, the idea of the scientific method where you begin to get students to question the experiment, look at the results. Um, but you're teaching science, but you're doing it in a way that doesn't um, 
uh, it's an explicit way of doing it, I guess, um, using experiments as a vehicle for um, engaging kids with the scientific method. Um, David, um, last show that you were at, um, the Fair Hangout, uh, you mentioned something about blowing up the lab. And I know that's a very popular session that you run at the Science Teachers Conference. Do you really blow up a lab? Well, <laughs> we're using gunpowder, obviously, uh, which does, as we all know, blow up. But uh, yes, gunpowder, but in a simulation, uh, which means that uh, instead of exploding, it's going to be your computer on your screen, really. And then if it does explode, you can always reset the screen. Um, the animation yeah. and simulation. Yeah, I've, I've often found it hard to respawn students after I've done a major explosion in the lab. Um, well, don't forget to, uh, well, you do this one on the computer. Don't forget to hook up the speakers and hear the little explosion sound that happens. Do you find that um, there is a need for a subject association to actually kind of bring this together? I think when you're mixing other subjects, uh, for instance, uh, English or history, you, have, you might lose your audience. And I therefore, I think having a specific subject base or a similar subject based association um, puts in that focus that's needed, um, attracts the right type of people who might need the extra resources and who want to help contribute to education. Okay, so um, is it about just that collegiality, um, just bringing people together uh, so that they can um, share and talk and swap their ideas? I think so because um, I think teaching, you can't teach on your, uh, it's not just some, you know, on, by yourself in the class. You have lots of support outside the class and having this uh, association is, is actual additional support. Um, it's very rare, I think, to see great teachers um, or, um, who, uh, who operate in isolation. Now, I'm going to bring up your web page. This is the uh, web page for Magnet Australia. The, I notice you've got yourself down as the Virtual Science and Technology Centre. So I'll just screen share that so any of our viewers can uh, watch. Now, could you explain a bit about um, how you're projecting yourself on the internet? Is it just a web page? Um, part of it is, is a web page, um, but uh, another part of it is um, we, I think, I suppose that most of the members who do run, who's his form magnet, actually have their own personal uh, part of the web page as well for their own students and, um, and use that as a vehicle as well. Um, uh, let's, it's not tying us down to just, um, we all need to share common things, but to enable us to draw what we need from, uh, from our collegiality. For, for instance, um, we like, some of us might want to incorporate some of that in our teaching, and so might want to put something a little bit for the kids to uh, read on the web. Um, so what yeah, this web page does is we, we're trying to uh, hopefully build up a great, fantastic resources. It's a little bit slow at this stage, um, so, uh, but we're getting there, I think. Um, although, uh, let's see what else is there. I think uh, it just takes a bit of time to, uh, well, to to make any organisation uh, build up to where we want it to be. Great. Now we keep talking about uh, something called STEM, and I think it'd be good to explain to some of the listeners um, what we mean by STEM. Uh, okay. I know there's a very good Wikipedia page that actually brings up um, some of the issues related to STEM. Um, I'll just bring it up on the screen. Yep. The Wikipedia page on STEM explains that um, it's a, an acronym. Um, it tries to bring together science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. Um, I guess the implications for doing that is that it's not being adequately handled by some of the different um, science groups and foundations and I wonder, um, we didn't talk about STEM back in the 1990s, um, why is there a need for us to do it now? I was recently um, actually at a conference and it was, it was done by my old 
well, my, my old lecturer, who's now the professor in Hezekiah and Setter uh, at La Trobe, and he mentioned a very uh, interesting concept, and that is the idea of, I believe, interdisciplinary approach, where it's not just one discipline that uh, industry needs. In fact, if you think about it, um, most of our subjects require elements from other areas. Uh, for instance, uh, chemistry requires elements of biology and physics, and well, physics requires elements of chemistry, and biology requires elements of chemistry, and sometimes physics. So, uh, and the maths is somehow interweaving a lot of those in those fields. So, it's rare. It's, oh, sorry, um, it's rare that, uh, to have a subject that's just that subject. I think, and I think it's. It's, you know, it's to recognise that we can approach science in, I guess, not just in one direction, but in all directions. There's an interesting, um, uh, on that page, there's a, an, an interesting uh, train of thought there around STEAM, which is including an A for the arts in that combination as well. I wonder how you feel about that, um, including some of the... Um, what we would call, although I don't agree with the theory, perhaps the right brain creative elements into that STEM kind of area. To me, if you look at something like um, engineering, it's always got that sense of um, creativity in it. Science is always something that you're exploring and investigating in a really creative kind of way as well. Um, I wonder how you feel about that inclusion of the arts. Is that something that you think is really interesting and worthwhile? It was a bit, a bit time of me. Um, well, I can't draw anything. I'm bad at posters. I used to, whenever every time in science, I'm sounds I'm fantastic, but every time in science, I was given a time to do a poster or time to do something creative and artistic. Uh, that's where my low scores come from. Uh, so I'm pretty bad at that. But I acknowledge that art is pretty important to some people, and that's why I incorporate that in my class. Although from a more of a visual communication aspect, I got my kids to uh, make videos of a sciencey of things. So for instance, they like doing experiments or product comparisons, and I'm making them do some science videos and flying. There's a chap called Nino Da Vinci who'd really want to disagree with you. Um, he wants to probably do an open dissection and uh, draw some of your organs, but it would look spectacular. And you think oh, about the, the marriage of science and arts. Um, we have this group called STEM, and we see that it's kind of techy and nerdy and appealing to people with numbers and facts and data collection. And we have STEAM, which includes arts. And I led a group um, in 2010, I think it was, to Canberra. And um, it was a Vic Road, Vic Road sponsored project which um, celebrated science, technology, but it was also a dance production, and so I was able to introduce uh, an element of the arts, and we called ourselves Steam Cloud. It, it's interesting that um, there are STEM protagonists who object to the idea of arts being included, and there are art teachers who see this as a natural context for them to celebrate their work. Um, you made the comment you can't draw, but do you think that the arts has a place in um, a STEM culture? What about Jenny? Now you're in a cross-disciplinary field, um, teaching as a primary school teacher. Do you think that there's enough scope for teachers to be able to bring together all those different disciplines? You might need to unmute yourself first. In primary schools, we're um, forever integrating all our subjects and science gives so much context for artwork to be done so that whatever might be doing in science, there's always a model that can be made, a diagram that can be drawn. I, I don't see how you could do it without it because um, it just helps you visualise and share what you're doing in, that, in science with other people. So it's a, it's a form of, com of a communicator to know you're doing your science by yourself and no one else being able to know about it and using the arts is how you communicate so it um, just goes together really nicely. I guess um, even bad art 
would have a place to hang on somebody's wall. But is there room for bad science, Jason? If we were to <laughs> unpackage it. Oh, I think there's always room to learn from mistakes and from errors and science is littered with the concept of learning from um, what some scientists would consider bad science until it becomes the accepted norm. But in <laughs> terms of the arts, um, I think we're actually losing sight of what the intent of, st of STEM was. STEM was a specific initiative to try to encourage um, math, science, technology and engineering education. Um, and it gained some traction in that it was becoming successful as a way of highlighting the lack of attention being played to those disciplines. The arts then saw that they were being left out and wanted some advocacy for their own area as well. So there's been some advocation for including the arts in there. But the question then comes, what about all the other areas that are being ignored? Um, do they also add on to the acronym? Um, why does arts have an additional privilege to be included and say not um, geography or or some of the other areas that don't get included. So um, the idea of STEM was to actually promote the the um, inclusion or the strengthening of the sort of the science maps um, sort of nerdy aspects mm -hmm. of education that were being neglected. Um, I don't disagree at all with the idea of integration and I think that that's um, a really important point, but I think it's a different point than what the STEM initiative was focused on. Uh, and STEAM I consider is just sort of a, a bit of a me too sort of um, promotion for the arts, which the arts certainly need promotion as well, but it's a different focus than um, STEM. And did STEM... It's interesting. Did, sorry. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> did, it, did it come out of that concern for um, STEM-based futures and careers not having enough traction or enough follow through. Is that one of the the key reasons why it was something to um, begin a more detailed focus on in education? Is that a correct understanding? Well it came basically from students not going into university courses and not doing senior courses around science and technology um, and mathematics and there was considered a, a major problem particularly in the United States but also here in Australia that students were being put off those subjects, um, mostly because there was such a wide range of other subjects that it had merged and they were seen as rather difficult and often not the best career path so there was a big push to try to reinvigorate interest in the science and mathematics. Engineering and um, technology never really gained much traction and it's really been a science and mathematics initiative to try to boost numbers in those courses. Um, so that's been the focus and it has had some success um, and that's why we now see the arts also coming in because they've also been an area that's been marginalised in some areas of um, curriculum choice. Mm. It's interesting too that um, you do get other groups that um, find a stake and an interest. To, um, you mentioned about um, arts finding leverage inside STEM with STEAM. Um, there's been some um, also moved by some um, women who would like to see um, a greater representation of some of their achievements and their goals. Um, I have a video to share and if you can just bear with me for a moment. Um, this was one that was uh, put out by a group uh, called Goldie Blocks. I think it's a company and the video is a, um, a Rube Goldberg machine the machine itself um, has been made by some girls um, using toys that um, some of the toy companies would rather they sit down and maybe play on the lounge room floor with and they've remashed this entire machine into a Rube Goldberg machine using some really creative engineering. Now, I don't necessarily believe these girls have done it as a marketing company, but it conveys a message which I think is really positive about girls engaging with technology, um, being able to remash it to what they want to do and play with it. And the narrative is actually quite good if you listen to the way that they launch themselves into space. Um, there is some controversy over the Beastie Boys song that they've appropriated. So if you don't mind, I'm going to um, hit the uh, talk button and uh, we can run a narrative. Um, the video um, you can find by just typing in uh, Goldie Blocks and 
YouTube, and I'm about to play it in the uh, chat room here. Now, I'm actually um, over-talking the video, so we're not picking up the sound. It was actually the lyrics in the actual video was what the uh, group was actually picking up on. It wasn't so much the uh, sound or the, um, the music of the video. The unusual thing about the way I think we sometimes uh, take groups like this, um, we often forget there are different groups that have different ways of actually um, pitching um, sales, ideas, uh, groups that want to promote a particular product, but it's nice to see actually something like engineering being picked up by girls and being presented in a way that's fun, playful and engaging. I'm just hoping about pressing the talk button, I can actually suppress the music there. So, it'd be nice when they can get over the controversy of the music. The lyrics there about girls as engineers who can use their brains. Don't underestimate girls. I'd be worried about swinging something into my TV to start it. So, do we need to maybe bring another vowel into the Steam? acronym to be able to promote the idea of um, girls in science or is it much bigger than that that it's just we've got to accept that um, they have a valid place in any science curriculum and we need to redress the balance perhaps of um, decades of ignoring the role that girls can play or decades of just giving yeah, girls dolls Girls are better than me. <laughs> so you reckon, David, is that something that you're going to actively address with your group? Uh, well, I actually, actually, I don't actually, um, I don't actually encourage stereotypes in my class. Um, at least I don't think I do. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I've always, I mean, I've got girls who are interested in in science. Um, well, only one at this stage. Um, in my class every and every year if the girls participate it's just as much as the boys usually. And it's interesting um, watching I guess the, the chatter around this kind of video because it's obviously stirred up some controversy and some people have said you know uh, providing specific toys for girls to explore engineering um, is still separating them, it's still giving them that gender role. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be boys toys and girls toys it should be that we're actually investigating these concepts together girls don't necessarily need something that's pastel and slightly pink um, to explore engineering they just need the same tools that boys have been using so maybe it's more about breaking down those stereotypes and providing those positive role models I did read in a newspaper article that did said something similar to this that uh, marketers um, or for, you know, for companies that toys were um, to uh, to perhaps to be less stereotyped and advertise um, no don't advertise as boy toys or girl toys as such. Yeah. My daughter just wrote a letter to Santa asking for a yellow digger. Okay, she told me I wrote it, but I was okay. pretty impressed. <laughs> Two years old writing. That would be yeah, no. Okay, I did the writing, she did the talking. <laughs> uh, Jason, I wonder if you have any um, comment on the, the gender context within a STEM or computer science perspective? Oh, I think it's a very nuanced and complex issue that people have been struggling with for many, many years. Um, and it's not just about making 
the environment and the tools um, girl friendly or, or sort of girl focused um, there is a point that we do sometimes um, masculinize the, the science and engineering and um, technology environments um, with our examples from male um, scientists and engineers and so forth and there is a point to be made that we need to introduce um, equivalent female examples it would be great if there were more of those that we could actually um, incorporate but um, they certainly do exist and they need to be sort of balanced so that the girls don't get a one-sided view of who's involved in engineering and technology and mathematics but in relation to making things um, sort of feminized or girlified I don't think that's particularly as strong um, I don't think that it really goes a, a long way but then again we're talking very young girls here who as much as we do try to break gender stereotypes they do exist in the toy industry um, and having toys that the girls can still be comfortable with and be engaged with in science and engineering so that the ones that they are going to be marketed at and incorporate which do tend to be the Barbies and the other um, sort of stereotypical toys if they can incorporate some um, more positive role model aspects um, the Barbie scientist or the Barbie engineer or whatever um, that if they are going to be caught up with that whole marketing aspect then at least they might still incorporate some um, positive role modeling through that as much as can be done through those so it's a very complex issue and I don't think it's going to solve the gender imbalance in math science technology engineering very quickly um, I think that's much more to do with uh, parents and teachers um, having expectations for their students um, or for the children as to what their options are and overcoming our, their um, perceptions much more than overcoming the, the students and the child's perceptions because it's really the children getting so much of their prompts from their parents and then from their teachers that do most of the damage in that respect. And perhaps from some marketing as well. Uh, Jenny, I wonder if you have some uh, reflections to share on this. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just been thinking about it because um, I have four children and three sons and one daughter. Um, I have two sons who are engineers. One's just finished third year at university and one's qualified engineer. Um, my daughter is not an engineer and, and wouldn't have had any uh, want to be an engineer. So what did we do to make that happen? I don't know. I'm trying to think. They all play with blocks. Um, they, the Lego was in the house and it's Lego's a funny thing because um, my youngest is 19 and there's no Lego in sight and yet if I do vacuuming there's an odd bit of Lego appears from somewhere. <laughs> Those right. chinks up the vacuum clean I often wonder what they are if it's worth going back for the dust bag to retrieve them. I don't know, it just appear from nowhere. I'm like, where did this Lego come from? So, um, but but I don't know how you know what makes them do the things they do. But there's, there's got to be more than just the toys. I think it's it's role models in real life and what they see and I guess what they're exposed to in in secondary school when they're thinking about careers that sort of thing. Perhaps what their teachers, what it, what's been available, and their teachers have highlighted for them to see when they have those career days and things, and those sort of things and um, just real life role models, what they see people around them doing. So you think that we need more than um, uh, Lego people or pink Lego people to encourage um, science and technology and STEM um, in order to engage um, girls? There was in fact a really funny um, XCDC um, cartoon about um, Lego people. Um, they made the comment that uh, we're in fact reaching a nexus um, by the year 2017, the number of Lego people will actually exceed the number of people in the world. That's a bit scary. Um, I've noticed that we've also got um, Tony who's joined us. Uh, Tony um, is an engineer. I've noticed that your microphone's muted, Tony. I might ask you the question. Um, do you think that um, when we're encouraging science, technology, and engineering, and maps, that we actually give some due consideration to engineering. We're not just sort of sticking it in because we needed a vowel and it was a kind of handy acronym, but 
we need to engage with the wider dimensions of what engineering is about. That means the connections with economic and social knowledge. Oh, sorry. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay, look, I've, I've just come in very late on this. I had trouble installing the Google Plus whatever thingy. Um, I, I really should sit in and listen before I make any comments on this discussion. That's okay. I'm just asking the question generally, Tony. Um, we're talking about the uh, science, technology, engineering and maths or um, STEM. Um, there's a new subject association at uh, David's um, helping head um, called Magnet. Uh, about nearly two decades ago, I was a uh, magnet project officer. And I'm curious, um, you've got an engineering background, Tony. Um, do you think we give enough consideration to the, um, in schools, to the aspects of engineering? Um, there's certainly been a shift towards um, our society is moving from a manufacturing economy to a services economy um, and that's I think been reflected in the emphasis that they give at school um, on more um, human people focused subjects and a more people focused too subjects so engineering is obviously still very important. Jenny, do you think we do enough? Um, something I have noticed that I was also thinking about is um, with the uh, inter-schools for university and engineering courses being lowered to very low um, so that they can get people um, getting into the courses. I know for instance with, with my son's course I think there might have been 30 that started and by the end of his course 8 graduated. Um, so maybe something has to be uh, thought about for that as well because I mean they're, they're lowering the score so people who are very um, good at maths may not want to go into a course that has a very low score because it doesn't doesn't seem right or something because they've got a you know 90 odd score and, and the score to get in might be 65 it's very low um, so people who get on into it their mathematical skills may not be um, as good as they need to be so they have difficulty passing the course so there's, there's something with that as well that needs some sort of just shift, uh, some change in approach on um, thinking. What do you think? David, um, your reflection on that? Uh, so, well, to, um, I, re I think sometimes it's just the amount of support I guess students really require or what they need, I guess, during their courses. I, I mean, I, I know that some people have struggled um, in, um, yeah, I guess with all this partying, really, I, from what I hear. That's, that's, a, that's a good point, David. So just lowering the benchmark isn't going to necessarily improve the outcome. Um, no. It might become self-defeating when students discover the rigour that's really needed to be a, a, a good engineer the kind of maths and science technology that you do. Um, I think so. I wonder if it's more the um, the context for the powerful use of engineering for a purpose within um, what we do in, in schooling as well because to me um, engineering can really provide the context and the creative and the building kind of side to actually investigating the science and the maths kind of elements. It gives you that that real world hands-on kind of exploration. So you get to learn about, say, physics concepts and then test them out um, and, and try your theories and look at, well, if I constructed something this way, this is how it would work. If I did it this way, it wouldn't um, have the same goal. And I think if we're, if we're building those contexts um, and the, by the time students get to that university level, it, it won't be such a shock. And I've also heard of... Um, is it engineering without borders, similar to doctors oh. without borders, providing oh. that real uh, project-based, real world, making a different kind of context to um, at a university and a high school level as well. And I think things like that are, are more appealing and perhaps even more um, gender diverse in appeal as well. I'd certainly be more interested in um, making a difference in the world with, with the things that I was learning in high school as a girl rather than just learning how to do this and that. 
that makes sense. That's fascinating, Amanda. We'll have to get someone on from that group for a future show. Um, I just noticed there's an Engineering Without Borders organization Australia. I'll drop the link into the uh, show notes and uh, into the uh, the chat there. Um, I guess for my experience has been just that, Amanda. Um, when I had a chance to um, meet up with engineers in my high school, it had changed my focus of what teaching learning really meant. Um, Tony has uh, been to some of my science classes and I know I also had some Vicroid engineers and they provide a wonderful real world context to problem solving that's different from the clinical way that we present ideas and facts in science. Also um, in the teaching of maps it gives you um, a real world leverage and you could begin to bring into other uh, contexts and disciplines. Perhaps engineering is the secret that kind of holds group like STEM together by um, connecting it with the, the wider picture, the real world, economic, social um, dynamics that make up life. Maybe that's a real acronym we need to move towards, you know, life, L-I-F-E. Problems will sort of run out of letters and we're just playing with number games and that's what teaching is all about, I guess, connecting kids with the real world. I'm just conscious of the time there, and um, I might uh, start to wind up. I'll ask um, if uh, we move from right to left, uh, just asking each of the guests to um, just give some thoughts about what they think STEM might mean, um, where it might go, and uh, where do you think we should be thinking about it. So starting on the right with uh, Tony, and then Jenny, and then David, and then Amanda and I will finish up. Tony. Uh, I'd like... Yeah, I'd like to think uh, kids can fulfil their potential and if kids have got a, an in interest and an aptitude in science and maths, then I think it is good to give them real world problems, a real world context to problem solve in and develop their skills. Thank you. And Jenny? Um, um, I like the way that um the STEM has the um, integration of it all, of the different subjects. I don't think you can do one without the other. I'd also like to see a lot more real world practitioners brought into the classroom. And with our technology, that should be very easy. I know I, um, through Twitter, of course, um, set up my son that's qualified engineer when he was working on the Bar and Bridge uh, down near Geelong. And he yep. uh, conferenced with a school over in America, I think. And was you know, to explaining about the bridge and all that sort of thing with the class. And I think a lot more if we could get engineers and, and different people around, I guess probably there are some doing it, but if it was made more available, perhaps people would use that and bring that into their classroom more. So we get some more real life in our classrooms. It would be great. Thank you. David? I'm wondering if in the future we actually move away. Oh, we have... Uh, we move away from specific subjects and and call it something else. So not just called biology or chemistry or physics or um, or just simply maths. We actually have something that's more contextual type uh, subject or um, so or, or theme based in the future. Thank you. I was a project officer two years ago, so two decades ago at Magnet, and way back then we were continually struggling with real world examples of problem solving. Um, I guess things like the Apollo mission um, were really exciting for me with space science and um, solving problems and kind of dreaming of a different world. Maybe Magnet's doing some of that too by helping promote STEM, by um, doing something to get teachers to look outside the traditional barriers of um, just teaching a very narrow discipline. Um, the engineering E is exciting for me. There are some wonderful engineers with a group called Vic Roads, a local body, and I've done some wonderful work with them um, with uh, bridge building, vehicle destruction, and supporting the work by students um, with the STEAM Club. David, I like how brave you are with this technology, actually trying to use it to get a message out. I encourage you to pick up a pencil and maybe draw an A in your STEM, um, if only because it might also, if that cognitive dissidence um, help with your own learning and um, digital visualization. Leonardo da Vinci would be proud of you. Amanda. 
Um, thank you to everyone for getting up so early for our uh, conversation as well. It's kind of been good to see a little bit of sunlight streaming in people's windows, which has been lovely. Um, I, I've been really um, fascinated by our discussion this morning and I think it's it started off by talking about um, professional learning and supporting teachers and then it went into so many of the complexities of, of what STEM is and what it means for schools and I think that was really worthwhile to explore and I think there's probably a few more shows that we could do um, based on these concepts and how to get them involved in schools. And David, thank you so much for coming along and um, providing a bit of a context for us around what is the challenge to supporting teachers becoming uh, more collegial and sharing their ideas and, and blowing up labs together <laughs> safely from a distance virtually and, and things like that as well. Um, I'm really interested to follow this kind of engineering conversation that we've um, started mm -hmm. as well in terms of how we um, apply what we're learning and how we provide that deeper context for students to explore um, and maybe that real world application is, is more powerful than just including these subjects within a curriculum, um, making those connections and having those positive role models of engineering engaged within the classroom, as you've said there as well, Roland. Now, we do have another AC ELN broadcast next week. I think we're skipping tomorrow and then we'll do next Monday. Is that correct, Roland? That's right. Um, we're still trying to work out with the last few, two or three episodes that we've got for the year. I know we've got lined up um, uh, from Perth, we've got Michael, um, who wants to be talking to us um, about the wonderful work that um, he's been doing uh, with the, um, I think it's called um, Global um, kids project or um, digital classroom yeah and there's also a chap from New Zealand with the digital curriculum I want to chase up and we've got a Christmas special as well so um, hopefully if our plans work out um, Tony and Daryl might be able to join us but just wait and see how that works out first. Sounds good thank you for joining us everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you then bye.